Welcome to Mind Your Isness. In today's episode, an acclaimed actress, artist, and designer who has helped break barriers for Asian Americans in her long and amazing career in Hollywood, and author of her memoirs, A Watercolor Dream, The Many Lives of Iris Sue. Uh-huh. I, for one, was very excited. You completed it in 2020, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really was uh, extremely excited about the fact that you wrote that. So it's definitely an interview, but you know, more of a feel of a couple of people talking because luckily we actually do uh, know each other. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, God, from such a long time ago. Irene, when was it? I mean, we met in, uh, it had to be around 86 or 87, something like that. Yeah, I think that I, I must have gotten into Bikram Yoga and I don't know. I, I can't even remember. It must be like 81 or something, 80, maybe. Mm. I don't know. But uh, I did the teacher training the first one, whenever uh-huh. that was. Right. Uh, and then but I had already been taking yoga for a long time. So I, I said to the boss, I said, look, I'm working and I can, <laughs> cannot possibly do two classes a day. So right. I'm the only one that he allowed to do one class a day. You know, <laughs> well, so, and you were already te- you had already been teaching for I had already did well I I would just go to class. I would say I go to class like five days a week. Right. Four days and then one time during the weekend. You know, mm-hmm. so I uh am working full time. So it was a uh, uh, very busy schedule and so on and so forth. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm just excited. You know, like I said, that book, the title really warmed me uh, (laughs) because as soon as I whenever I see that this is so weird, but whenever I see the word watercolor, I it excites me because it terrifies me. Really? I, wow. I, so tell me about the the title, and I think you probably already know what I mean by that. As an artist, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I think in the book it explains that uh, watercolor artists are brave and takes chances. Uh, people who paint in watercolor, you know, you really can't go back and you know try to make it right. You know, once the stroke is down, it's pretty much down. Even with uh, a lot of experience, people can, you know, kind of correct that and whatever, but it's pretty much goes the flow, you know, so you have to kind of go with the flow of the watercolor and changing it and accidents happen, splatters happen, and sometimes those are the best things in that painting. And um, so I, I kind of explained that, why that my life is like a watercolor, because I didn't set out in life to be an actor. You know, I didn't set out in life to be, you know, just like some people, oh, well, I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. You know, mm. oh, I'm going to join the fire department when I grow up. Uh, oh, I want to be an astronaut when I'm, you know, stuff like that. You know, you're, when you're young and you have you have dreams, you know, and uh, uh, I I don't know. I never wanted to be a yogi, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like the things you became most successful at, you didn't plan. I didn't plan, no. The thing is that I came from a, a Chinese family that, uh, you know, a very good family. I was very uh, grateful that, uh, uh, but my mother is an artist. My mother is a very well-known artist. I mean, well-known in the sense that she um, taught at the uh, Art Institute in New York, and she she's a professional artist. She was a uh, in later years, she worked as a textile designer hmm. for uh, several different studios. Ah, because I know you did design as well. Yeah, I did design as well. So it just like I, I grew up with a lot of art. Yeah. Uh, I say like I came to America when I was 11 years old and moved to New York. And uh, uh, so uh, some of the book is about uh, my backstory, you know, how I grew up in a uh, very very kind of very complicated Asia. Uh, wasn't it Brit- British rule was still, wasn't it like a, it was. Yeah, a- well, I left China, Shanghai, when I was like three years old. So I don't uh-huh. really have 
personal recollections of it, except what my mother told me. Uh -huh. So then I, we lived in Hong Kong for seven years. And, um, uh, and it was, you're right, it's a British crown colony. That's what they called it, you know, the Commonwealth, mm. uh, the British Commonwealth. And uh, we actually had to go to the auditorium every day and, uh, you know, sing a, a, a national anthem. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, the British anthem. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. But I forgot so, what it was now, but allegiance to the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, <laughs> that's where you were when the ballet came up. Somehow, I just, you know, saw saw a poster or something of, of the red shoes, and I just got mesmerized by, by those red, red shoes. I was like eight years old or whatever, and I begged my mother, you know, I begged and begged her to enroll me in a ballet class. You know, and so she said, okay, okay, you know, my mother being the artist that she is, she she let me do whatever I want to do. You know? sure. <laughs> <laughs> so she took me to the ballet class, you know, twice a week, and then I took a bus home, uh, eight years old, you know, but wow. it wasn't very far from my house. Uh, so um, uh, so that's what I did. And then I have an aunt, interestingly, she was into ballet also, so on weekends, I, I asked my mom to take me to her house and then learn a few more steps, you know, that kind of stuff. So I was a, I, I had a wanted to be a, a ballerina. That's all I wanted to do. And, wow. Uh, interestingly, uh, my dream did come true. I, I was entered by my teacher uh, to a contest, which they held once every four years in Hong Kong. For the Commonwealth, you know, of the British Commonwealth. Right, right. And, and <laughs> Lord and behold, I, uh, I won. <laughs> I won the contest, and uh, so I was to go to Sadler Wells, which is the Royal Ballet at, at the time. I think it's called Sadler's Wells or whatever it is. And and uh, so my father flew in from Taiwan, which he lived. Uh, to Hong Kong, and they had a meeting in one of the high-rise buildings, and I was about this big, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so they explained to my father what the program calls for. I mean, it's like you you have to not only do I have to, of course, uh, train, you know, like five hours a day, and I have sure. to do my homework because I was uh, eleven years old. I have to do my own schoolwork, whatever right. place I was in. Um, and then after that, you you have no guarantee that you're you're going to be, you know, be for the ballet, let alone the premier dance dancer, you know. So uh, because I have to measure up the the physical height and weight that they want height, you to be weight that size. So oh. exactly, you can't have the, you can't have you know you know they want it to be like a very <laughs> uniform. All the what do they the call it? Like cookie. Like cookie cutter, cookie cutter. like, like <laughs> right, everybody the exactly, same. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then they said that, uh, and then you have to sort of work for them uh, in the court of ballet, you know, uh, unless she was like extraordinary and became a premier dancer. Uh, uh, you have to work for them to tour, you know, around the country, around the world. Uh. Uh, so. For seven years, so you're indentured, you're like an indentured servant to the royal oh. ballet. And this is a cell that they're trying to do for an eleven-year-old. That's right. <laughs> so eleven-year-old, and I, I had no idea what was going on. And all I know <laughs> is that my father said, "No, this is yeah. not not for us, uh, and <sighs> because we are moving to the to the United States." We had applied. Uh, apply to, to to come to the United States and uh, so you know it's taken us a long time uh, seven I, years I just uh, you know I had to do what my parents you know want me to do so and moved not to California we went to New York 
our relatives were all in New York and it was decided that we had to go to New York. So we got off the boat, uh, the ship and uh, crossing underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. It, it's just very, all very uh, exciting uh, for an 11 year old, you know. And, sure. And uh, you, I, I just asked my mom for some coins. They you have to throw coins when you pass the bridge that will guarantee you that you will return to the city of the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. Um, so I did, I did that. And wow. sure enough, I went back there and like six years later and uh, won the uh, beauty pageant of Miss Chinatown. <sighs> USA. Tell me a little bit about that because um, I've heard of that and I know that you uh, you had won it. And again, like the watercolor dream that your life is, <laughs> yeah. it's something you just kind of fell into. It's like I just look. fell into it. I had no desire to, you know, <laughs> to to be in a beauty pageant. I don't know what it's all about, but uh, as a young teenager. Um, you know, me and a few friends from school, from high school, you know, would go down to Chinatown, New York, and uh, we would hang out there, you know, because what else is there to do, you know? <laughs> so we would just go hang out there because there's a curio shop. Um, and the owner was very nice to us. He always gives us, you know, snacks, you know, we can take all the candy bars if we want to, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, lollipops, you know, and let us <laughs> go through the magazines, you know. So it's a place to hang out for, for us. So then he, one day he says to me, he says, you know, uh, we, they have this Miss Chinatown contest in San Francisco, and I needed one more person to go because New York has to send two representatives, New York being the big city. Uh, and I said, uh, and he said, I, I want to send you. <laughs> and I, I was like, like you know, what, what am I supposed to do, you know? So I said, I'm not even 17. And he said, they won't ask, you know, anybody. I said, you know, from my shop, they're not going to ask any questions. And besides, you're going to get, you know, the dresses made for you with your matching shoes, you know. Oh, wow. You know, and you're going to get jewelry. You're going to get trips. You're going to get, you know all kinds of gifts and everything. And I think it, wow, that sounds good because it's <laughs> happening to me in, in, in high school, you know. So I said, uh, I'll ask my mom, you know, and of course my mom said, oh, okay, go. So off I went. I forgot what it was, 10 days or something like that. 10 days. Oh, wow. There's a round of uh, banquets and they took us all to the band associations and, and, uh, you know, definitely did got us dresses, you know, <laughs> matching, matching high heels. And it was it was a lot of fun, you know, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, I assume that you, for your talent, I'm assuming you danced. Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> and because by then I had already been in a movie, Flower Drum Song. Oh, yeah. wait. So you were... How well? How? Because you were you were you were cast as a dancer in Flower Drum Song. That, That's right. and you I were was, on. Oh, you weren't even seventeen yet. No, I was sixteen years old. I'm still good friends with Nancy Korn. She was a she was the lead in the in the movie. <laughs> wow. And she also is from Hong Kong, and uh, I mean we didn't know each other, you know, because she's yeah. seven and a half years older than me, and I I. You know, in my book, I said, did she know that she had a room with a 16-year-old? You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, I don't know. So I, I I, was a kind of a big girl, you know, big teenager. I was like a chubby, a, a chubby teenager. Really? Because I, um, yeah, <laughs> that's I, interesting. Because like you, one of the things I know you mentioned before about how, uh, <laughs> how skinny you were, how little you were. Oh, oh, yeah. And this uh, <laughs> this little did, skinny thing. Yeah, a little skinny thing at 11. And by the time I was, I was 16, I was a, a very chubby teenager. <laughs> those candy bars at the at the grocery store. Yeah, those candy bars <laughs> and you know, all the junk food that I ate. It's, it's amazing how kids even grow up because they, they eat just junk, you know. <laughs> thing is my daughter, you know. 
And I said, well, you just got to have some real food. Oh, yeah, Mom, I had a bag of chips, you know, and I <laughs> Food. <laughs> potato oh, chips are potatoes. Yeah. It's a vegetable. Right. I'm going to have another one. I have some Doritos. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, that, that's pretty much what happened. Yeah. So, th- so when you won that, what was, what was like the main prize for, for winning? Well, it, it was so incredible because I have a very unusual last name, so not many people have my last name. You know, I'm not a Lee or Chang or Wong or something. So I uh-huh. didn't have a family association backing me. So, but then they found out that my grandmother's last name was really Tang or something like that. Mm-hmm. So then they kind of adopted me because the gifts are elaborate. They they were gold plaques, solid gold. 24 karat gold plaque. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I managed to keep kept two of them. I, lost, I even lost one. I, I was, you know, diamond watches, okay, <laughs> which I lost also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the gold plaques are, they're big. They are, I would say, like almost like a three by four, you know. Oh, my God. And that report. Yeah, and uh, I got the key to San Francisco given to me by the mayor of San Francisco. I, I lost that too. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, now you start to mention them, they'll start popping up on eBay <laughs> <laughs> after all these years. Right. Now you got to travel too. Yeah, I got a trip around the world. Oh, God. I know, and uh, I, I, uh, and very friendly with the passenger supervisor who was my chaperone. And uh, he was the Pan Am passenger supervisor or something. Very, very nice uh, man. And uh, we became really good friends uh, throughout until he passed, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. He was a very good singer for some reason. Hmm. And he would always sing, sing you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I really appreciate people who can sing because that's not one of my things. I can <laughs> you do sing. so many things. That's just one of the things. Yeah, one of the things do. that I cannot do. Is that a part calls me to cross for me to sing. I write on oh, a penny. Yeah. So um, <laughs> anyway, um, and my husband would say, "It's in your marriage contract, don't you know that you're not even allowed to sing in the shower." <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You are not in the shower because I'm in the shower and I'm comfortable. So they they just shut up. (laughs) Well, being an artist, you can't help it, you know, from such a young age to be so surrounded by art. That whole idea of getting stuff from the inside to the outside was a normal thing in your family. Well, I'm just so, yeah, everybody's family is different. I mean, a lot of family, you know, maybe they're, musicians and they grow up to be musicians you know mm. I mean? uh or actor you know there are these acting dynasties you know sure yeah and uh as you know and even the yoga dynasty which uh when the anurag or Raju want to carry on yeah they, they definitely can if they wanted to if they know? want to they certainly can yeah. now once you once you finish that you were still pretty young by the time you uh, did your first movie? Yeah, mm-hmm. I was just an uncredited dancer. I mean, if you look on IMDb, uh, I was an uncredited dancer. But right. because of the Flower Drum song, I got my break. I I really got my first break. You know, just one of the chorus, you know, dancer, and um, uh, I was asked by the director, who was a very big director, Henry Costa. He was like. Mm movies like The Robe and, you know, African Queen and just huge. He asked, you know, a couple of dancers, you, you and you and picked out three girls and I was one of them to do one little, uh, one little line of the song. Okay. So it's like step down two steps. Okay. Imagine this is a musical. You know, so step, step down, step down, put your hands on, around your face. <laughs> Go chop suey. <laughs> then he has a, a, you know, this one line from the song. Okay, I mean, don't forget, it was a Rogers and Hammerstein uh, musical. You yes, know? It, it was huge. So of course, I, I said, sure, you know. So 
I'm in the middle. There's one girl to do on each side. So we step down and go, chops. He says, he says, okay, whatever you do, don't look into the camera. You can look to the right, look to the left. Do not look in the camera. Got it? <laughs> Got it. So I stepped down and I stared right into the camera. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's go again. Okay. Ready? Rose out. Action. Look right into the camera. I must have done that like three, four times. I was so embarrassed. I thought, I thought for sure I'm going to be, you know, <laughs> fired. And so finally, I, I kind of like one glance and I, I looked to the side. Because I think prior to that, I've never been on camera before, but only mm. still photography, which you do look right to the camera. Sure. Because the photographer would just ask you to, oh, tip your head down a little bit. Okay, this way. Okay. Oh, that, you know, you look, you're looking at a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I just had no clue, uh, you know, and I was just, it's a good thing it was a big set at Universal. I mean, you know, they created a whole Grand Avenue yeah. on, the, on the soundstage. And I, uh, I just, you know, trying to be invisible so that he wouldn't know what he'll find come and buy me and say, you know, young lady, you're fired. Right, right. <laughs> the only person in a movie trying not to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, I was like so embarrassed. Or anyway, um, um, maybe, you know, a week later or something, you know, the movie shoots for a long time, obviously, you know, so maybe a few days later or a, a week later, you know, he comes to me and said that, you know, I would like for you to, uh, uh, I have a part in my next movie with Jimmy, and uh, I would like for you to come to my office and get the script, and uh, there's a part in there for you. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> what in the world is going on? And, and first of all, I I don't know who he Jimmy, Jimmy who, you know? So I, I went around the set and I said, you know, he told me that he was doing a movie with Jimmy. And who's Jimmy? Who's Jimmy? <laughs> it was Jimmy? It was Jimmy Stewart. You know? Oh. Yeah. He, he is huge. Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Huge, huge movie star, you know? That's how you got that part? Yes. And, and it was a great part. That's the one where... The, uh, you start off at the at the phone, right? Where you right. tell him you'll dial the phone for him or something. Yeah, it was all in French, and I was I was this young hooker in uh, in, in in Paris somewhere, you know. And uh, so I had to jump on his back, and then they try to find me off, and you know. And a big chunk of it was in French. It a was big, all in French. It was not, pretty much yeah, right. Well, I'm not one word in English. <laughs> and you were speaking French quite fluently. Oui, je parle français comme un parisien. <laughs> oui, well, je ne parle well, français, mais je comprends un peu. Très <laughs> bien, très bien. What, because of the ballet, I learned French. All the ballet, you know, vernaculars are in French, you know, pop the bra, bra, bra. Yeah, Arabic, true that. You know, tombe. So, uh, so because of the ballet, I thought, well, I really want to be a ballerina. I didn't learn French, and I want to speak French, and so on and so forth. <laughs> uh, so then the French was very helpful to me, and so I got the part. And, <sighs> you know, and the director liked me so well that he wanted to put me in all his other movies, you know, two <laughs> other movies. And, and I couldn't even do it. I think I did maybe one other one, but I, I couldn't do it because I then got busy on other projects well but I got my, yeah i got my screen actress bill card and then they said you better find an agent uh you know because you're an actor now i said <laughs> i guess i am you know, i'm an actor now <laughs> yeah i have a uh, actress bill card and so uh and there was only like two agencies that handle most of the agents you know i mean you played all across the Asia, not only did you play so many different kinds of Asians, right? You're, you're right. Uh, you even got roles that weren't originally for Asians. That's very, 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 you know, uh, very astute of you to to say that because some 
Asian producers will complain that you don't even play, you didn't even play Chinese parts. <laughs> I, you know, and I said, you know, I mean, I was way ahead of my time. Now it's all diversified, diversity, you know. Sure. Like, like a car can be, you know, an African American or Indian, you know, or Asian or East Asian. I don't even know what they consider what is what, you know, or, or whatever. So it, it always happens that way that, uh, it, it, it's the director who who selected me. You know, wow. I was, uh, uh, for example, I was, I did the movie called Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Yes. That's where you played, and I know this. <laughs> that's where you played the Jewish, <laughs> the Jewish prince. <laughs> right. It was like I went. <laughs> I went to the casting person, you know, big casting director, and uh, I was up for a Chinese interpreter's part. You know, there was a Chinese delegate and I was supposed to be the interpreter or leading a, a, a group to the, you know, the, the L.A. place or something uh, in the hills. So I went to the interview and long story short, she looked at me and she said, you know, you, you're just too too glamorous for this part. Go to the bathroom and <laughs> take off some of your lipstick or, you know, uh, uh, blush. Uh, I said, okay, sure. I went to the bathroom, wipe off, everything came back. But she said to me, she goes, nah, you, you, just, you, you just look too pretty or something. <laughs> and, and I thought, shit, I'm not going to get the part of her. Oh, really? That really, really sucks. She said, well, well hold on, man. Don't go, don't go. Uh, I was talking to the director of, uh, is Paul Mazursky, and he said, uh, is another absolute genius, has done so many incredible movies. And he said, she said, he was kind of mentioning to me that he may cast one of the parts, a non, uh, non-American, some mm-hmm. other than, you know, just all white American. He said, you know, uh, be prepared to meet him. I'll call you, I'll call your agent, you know, this afternoon and set up an appointment to meet Paul. Hmm. I said, okay. So sure enough, she did. And then the meeting was the very next day, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, his, his office was in Beverly Hills. And I was just, you know, I, I waited there out in the, in the uh, reception area forever. So then I, I just went into a kind of a meditative, you know, sort of state. Uh, there's nothing to be nervous about. There was only a few lines that I'm supposed to do. He wants to read. He wants to read me. I said, okay. Uh, you know. So then finally, I got to go inside, and we said we said our hellos, and I uh, and he said, you know, go ahead, read. You know, he wants to read with me. So we, we read a few work for a few lines. He said, this is it. You're Sheila Walsworth. I'm <laughs> Sheila Walsworth. <laughs> Sheila Walsberg. That's yeah. got to be one of the best names that you've had in your career as, as an actress. <laughs> Sheila Walsberg. And the thing is that, yeah. you know, a director or a casting people, they are more, they are even happier than you getting the part because for them to search for the right person for the right part is a big yeah. job. You know, yeah. as you know, if you cast the wrong person, it just, it's not going to make their movie. That's an interesting side. That's an interesting side note for a sec. Because I know, like in casting, mm-hmm. uh, I've actually been in the office while casting people were casting. Mm-hmm. They are rooting. This is kind of an, a side note to actors. Mm-hmm. They're rooting for you exactly. more than you know. They, yeah. they want you. They want you to be the one so they can go home. <laughs> that's right. You're right. Don't have to see the twenty other people. You know. <laughs> oh my God! This this one is it. Please, please, okay, okay. Can't be sitting there whole day already. So uh, that that is so true. So <laughs> so uh, oh my God! Paul was ecstatic. He grabbed me by the arm and he walked me down the hall, knocked on people's <laughs> doors. You know his uh, his uh, producer, you know Pato Guzman and whatever, you know a, a, assistant director or anything, you know, wardrobe or whatever, knock on the door and. and <laughs> This is Sheila Walsberg. This is Sheila Walsberg. Meet Sheila Walsberg. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I, you know. Oh. So things like that just happens to me. Right. Uh, I mean, 
Uh, I, I'm a very lucky person, knock on wood, you know. Yeah. Uh, I I think that um, I just, uh, well, with, with acting like everything else, or an athlete or a musician, you know, you have to have some some talent. And then yeah. a lot of hard work sure. and the right time and the right place. Sure, luck can get you there, but you got to. Yeah have something you, to stay there that's right you got to have something to stay there you, yeah. you, don't, you just it's not because it's such a competitive business and you don't know what they're looking for you know what is it they're looking for now mm. you're a very unique character you know your look your whatever it is you know maybe just right for something you, mm. you don't know people may say uh I don't know. I'm, I, I wanted this part to be, you know, the writer. Usually the meeting would be, you know, just not the director. I mean, not the casting. Sometimes the director is there or the writer is there, you know. Very mm-hmm. seldom the producer is there. But sometimes when they come to uh, the second call or something, you know, then they're all there. they got to check you out. Now, you're, now you're, um, your list of credits is major. Like so many movies, yeah. so much TV, mm-hmm. not to say growing up and, you know, just being a young person in the, you know, 70s, 80s, you were everywhere. And yet when I met you, I I didn't realize that you. I recognized you, but, you know, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, we were working, you know, every time I saw you, we were working out. Yeah, exactly. Or, or on occasion, I would see you at a gathering or a party, or I'd just randomly see you somewhere at some Hollywood thing. Um, so I knew you had, you know, but when it, it took ages for me to realize that you were that person, it kept emerging. Now, I can't be the only one this happens to where they go, oh, that was you. Yeah, well, I kind of like, um, I, I did a lot of things, but I really don't want to let on that I'm an actor. Primarily, I'm, I've am i been an actor since I was 15 years old, you know? So, uh, but then I'm also, a, you know, a fashion designer. Right. That satisfies my, my, my creative thing. But it happens to, to, to a lot of actors because actors are creative by nature. So Absolutely. in between... In between pictures, like for example, um, uh, Harrison Ford, he's a tremendous carpenter. Oh my God. I mean, oh. He has done cabinets for a producer friend of mine. I just looked over and oh wow, these cabinets are really interesting. I've never seen anything like it. You know, they're a kitchen cabinet. And he said, yeah. Harrison made them for me. Wow. So, oh, you know. So in between movies, he come over and work on cabinets, and they also a lot of big stars. They're flipping houses because not flipping houses to you know. I mean, they make money, but they, now, they, they you, have the creative energy. You did speaking of flipping houses, you did real estate, right? Yep, mm-hmm, for thirty years. Right. So, so that that's why the the I don't know. I think is the, the, the evolution or the evolving when you start to unpack these different things with Irene Sue, it's like your expression, you do have a fearless watercolor kind of existence. That's, you couldn't have picked a more perfect title for your memoir. Yeah, I just, well, I mean, you just have to, you know, you know, not exactly like winging it, but the thing is that you have to do something for the first time. It's, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I go by my instincts a lot, you know, so you, I'm sure you do too, because you, I know that a very creative person. I see what you, I, I do see what you mean there is that, that, that initial jump off point, you do have to have enough faith and trust some kind of intuition that this is going to be okay. And, and, you know, the way things have felt just sim- seem to fall into place uh, with all of the movies your introduction to Sinatra, which I know always people ask you about, uh, yeah. even that was completely random. Completely random. I, you know, because I think one thing that kind of gave me so much visibility 
into the homes of people is the commercial that I did. Two commercials at the same time, Chevron's for Standard Oil of America and uh, Hawaiian Punch for right. Dr. Gamble. Even right. though I was not the, the little fruit juicy guy, uh, I did all their uh, you know, countrywide campaign and posters and mm -hmm. industrial films and make personal appearances for them and mm -hmm. almost like simultaneously, you know. Uh, so I was I was really in corporate America, believe me. <laughs> do you, do you know, that's a very interesting angle, too, because not all even people who do commercials and stuff don't always get those kinds of campaigns. Yeah, that campaign was. Like I said, you know, I was just born under a lucky star or something. You know, it was like uh, there was a, a commercial house that was very busy, busy, busy. They were shooting around the clock, you know, like three crews a day, 24 hours. Mm. And uh, he was doing so many commercials. So he called me and he said, I mean, you know, you're a dancer. You know, I, I'm, I'm shooting this, um, you know, Tahitian, you know, campaign. <laughs> I said, I'm a dancer, but I don't know how to do Tahitian. You know? <laughs> he said, just go rent a tape and, you know, uh, <laughs> rent, a, you know, South Pacific or, you know, one of, it's something that has <laughs> Tahitian dancing. I, I, I said, okay. And it's not easy. My God, these Tahitian dancers have been doing this since they're five years old, you know? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, I... I can only imagine that uh, there must have been kind of a bittersweet thing. Like when you were filming uh, with Elvis, you filmed that at the, uh, was that at the, that was at the Polynesian Cultural Center on Oahu, right? Oahu, exactly. Right. Now, here you are at the Polynesian Cultural Center that celebrates all these different uh, uh, cultures of Polynesia, mm -hmm. and you're the star who's not Polynesian. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Playing. So there must have been kind of a, I would, I would imagine it was a, bit, a bittersweet kind of a thing for them to be, you know, celebrating, ah, she's Asian. It was like, ah, why couldn't it have been one of us? <laughs> uh, all the Hawaii, Hawaiians hate me. I'm, a, I'm, not, but I'm always a Hawaiian, you know, and, uh, you know, in the commercials too, you know, and uh, I, I got the commercial, I don't know, just by food because they were, Casting all day long, and by the time I got there, it was two o'clock, and uh, I didn't go on there until four o'clock or something. And they were real Tahitian dancers, they were from the reviews, they got coconuts and machacas, and right. And the, <laughs> that's why I was thinking it wasn't just a, an not just a Polynesian cast, but the Polynesian cast from the cultural center. Yeah, I know they were oh my gosh. I, I was like, oh my God, I'm definitely not, couldn't make it, you know. So uh, you, you just have to wing it, you know. Sure. It, you know? Could you please just describe that when you met Elvis on the set? Because how yeah. you described him yeah. uh, is just delightful. Yep, that was just really the absolute truth. I was uh, the first day on set, and, uh, uh, you know, basically I wasn't working that day. It was just, you know, went and had lunch and hung out and, and just, you know, said hello to people and, you know. Um, so then I uh, I was kind of tired, you know, like uh, nervous the first day. I thought I would just go to my dressing room and lay down. I wasn't doing anything, you know. And I go to the dressing room and the air conditioning wasn't working. It was terrible. So I thought, I can't lay down here. Where am I going to go? So I looked around and I thought, I just took this little path because there was like a lot of fake... Uh, uh, structures there, you know, there, there was a queen shack and there was a whatever, whatever. I started walking and I went, I, I was watching my my feet because there was cobblestones, you know, I didn't want mm. to like, fall down or twist my ankle or something. Uh, so I going like this and then all of a sudden I felt a hand right in front of me like, like this, you know, to me and I go, oh, who, who, what was that? Oh, he's a young lady, you can't come this way, you know, uh, it's always this dressing room. Oh. And I thought, oh, you know, this is really not good. <laughs> he said, no, 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 just wait here. I, I just have to check with him. I came back immediately and said, sure, come this way, come this way. So I followed him. I went into the uh, 
Queen's shed, and of course they they had air conditioning in there. Nice. Uh, took me to the side room where I guess it's set up as this massage room. It's got like a massage table there. You know, so so I took lie down here, and he brought me a good towel or something. You know, so I just like went to sleep, passed out, it was very comfortable, and I opened my eyes, and somebody was putting a cold compress on my forehead. And and it was Elvis. He was like about twelve inches from my face. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I've never, I've never seen anybody that looked like him or sounded like him. And there never is anybody that sounded or looked like the king. You know, oh he was just amazing. He, he's so, he's really beautiful. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I think you know what to say. You know, so it's just I. I just smiled a little bit, so like he said, "How are you feeling?" Or something. And the first thing that came to my uh, my mind was that he smells like baby powder and milk. <laughs> you know how everybody's got a scent, you know, like you know, right. baby, baby powder and, and milk. Yeah, <laughs> baby powder and milk. <laughs> you know, because I'm very sensitive. Smells very sensitive. Yeah, you know. That's really overwhelming. I mean, uh, that... baby powder. No. So that's the first <laughs> impression I had of Elvis. You know, of course, he was so beautiful. He is just so beautiful. And, uh, oh, my God. And he was very nice. He said, uh, uh, you know, we can get you anything you want to eat, you know, you know, whatever you want. But stay away from the fried chicken. We're in Polynesia. You know? <laughs> stay away from the southern fried chicken. <laughs> I love it. That's what I remember he told me. Oh my god! That's when it was my first encounter. So you did, um, oh, you know, you, well, you did so many movies. Uh, the television shows is where I know that. Well, first of all, most of the movies I saw, <laughs> at, <laughs> And even more than that was the television stuff. Everything from yeah. I Spy to Perry Mason. Um, and from Uncle, one, yeah, just Right, Wonder finish. Woman. Uh, yeah, wow, there were just so many. And then you did uh, one of the Star Treks. Yes. Uh, it's, the, and, it's the Voyager. It's the second generation of Star Trek. Voyager. Right, you played the parent of one of the crew members. Right. I was the oh. mother to... Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the regular guys there, you know. Right. I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant show because they uh, we kind of like really in a time war because we shot the film, we shot the scene. That the set is just incredible. I mean, we were only on one little corner of the set because they had built an entire starship on whatever studio you know <laughs> lot that was, <laughs> and. Uh, well, now, now so many things are CGI. Like I, I just, when you were talking about different movies that you have been in, when there were set sets, like, yeah. you know, this is, this, that's really in a, that's a real set over there. Those are real tanks. <laughs> you know, those are, I know the real river, you know, the lagoon and real, uh, you know, so many extras. I mean, in most movies, it would have taken at least a week to shoot that scene. They would have to do so much coverage, you know. <laughs> But sure. uh, being that it's an Elvis movie and they 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 did it only because to sell his records, you know. So uh, and it's very sad. He had the saddest life. It's just mm. he's, he's such a really good, nice person, you know. I finally went to uh, Graceland, you know, about five years ago. Invited, yeah. Uh, that's I had never wanted to go, and my mother is an Elvis fan. She was really ticked off that I didn't go to his memorial, and, <laughs> and then you know after the movie, he, I, all of us uh, co-stars were given big boxes of his, you know, CDs and you know the the, the, the photographs and uh, just the whole press kit. Yeah. And would you have signed, of course, and would you believe, you know, as a young actress, I moved around so much, and, you know, I, you know, I moved from one apartment to another one, another one, that the whole box got wet and I threw it out. <laughs> <I know. laughs> you know, you know so, there, there's something to be said about 
So, okay. There's, there are so many things that keep popping up. It, there's all this wonderful magic that's happening. And then there's also the releasing of stuff like, like whether it happened that way or like other in, in other ways you have done, like, like you mentioned those awards, you know, they came, there was an excitement and then, yeah, and then I lost it, then it was gone. So that wonderful way of gathering, uh, reminds me of something I know you've mentioned about in, in regards to art that like different types of Chinese artists, uh, would specialize in certain kinds of art. Yeah. And that someone you were associated with would make these amazing uh, drawings and then occasionally throw them away. <laughs> and then you would go get them. Yeah. I, was, I mean, I grew up with, my God, world-class art. I mean, I didn't even appreciate it because I was a, a kid. I'd be roller skating, you know, crashing into them. My mother's like, no, 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 no. There were, I remember in, in, in New York or in a, you know, a, a kind of an old high rise building uh, overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, and uh, it, it had belonged to her, her teacher from China, the artist. And he's quite well known for painting goldfish. You know, he was like the master of goldfish. And so I grew up with art, you know, like my mother would be painting and then they would splash the walls with, you know, watercolor, you know, so, uh, and, uh, and, and I it didn't know, I was a kid, I, I just saw these incredible, you know, horses, you know, of, you know, black ink horses, but that screen was like a five piece or six piece screen on gold with, um, it, it's lotus leaf. Oh I my mean, God. These, these are, my God, just world-class artists. And they had gotten smuggled out of China because when the communists took over, the artists didn't want them to be confiscated, you know. So they smuggled them out and somehow they all ended up in my mother's teacher's uh, apartment. And you're just running around and they're like a kid. Like if... yeah, I was just running around crashing into them. You know, <laughs> crashing into national treasures treasures exactly these things are probably in museums in washington dc right now you know, oh <laughs> you know? so i was like I, I grew up with with art i grew up with the process of you know splashing and this and throwing it out and starting all over again and you know it's not like oil that you can just go over and over and over again you know, until you feel that it's right. I mean, not that oil is, is a bad thing, but I... It's just different. It's different. It's different. Because you know, even just when I... When I when I've uh, attempted to do watercolor, I, I play around with ink, with like some, uh, you know, Chinese ink and rice paper. It's really kind of... Right. It's fun to play with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but whenever I tried to do any kind of watercolor, it, it's, a, it's a very, very unpredictable medium. Uh, so when did you actually start doing watercolor? I'm curious about that because what, was it just a, like from a kid playing and all of a sudden you were doing it or did you do that later? Uh, later because my mother would not let me study art. She, cause she'll say you're starved to death. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, what about I should be an architect or something? You know, cause that, that to me was also kind of artistic. Oh, no, no, no. My dad would say, who do you think is going to hire a you know, <laughs> Chinese woman architect? You know, I mean, the, you know, this was back then, you know. Sure. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's it. You know, yeah. I've been an actor. Oh, my God. You might as well be walking the streets. This is like terrible, just horrible. But uh, they were just so unsupportive of me. And I think it was despite of, it was really, you know, a friend of mine once said to me, he says, are you doing this for your dad or are you doing this for yourself? Mm. You know, because I have to prove it to him for somehow that I've got to make it. I have no other way to, no, no other way to go. You know, he, well, you know, that's... Uh, that, out of that, the house, you know, I was 15 years old. 
it's interesting how like you mentioned earlier about um with the watercolor you have to you have to just set the intention and you just have to go for it and that seems like everything that you've done was kind of that and simultaneously completely unpredictable it's sort of like you put forth the i want to do this yeah. and then these unpredictable things started to happen to <laughs> to, to make that exactly. thing happen exactly you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I mean, I could talk to you forever, but I thought I that uh, I want to tell you that um, I, I'm going back to art finally, okay? Because I have a, a guest uh, guest bungalow uh, in my little tiny house. I cleaned up and just, you know, had it painted and everything, and that's going to be my art studio. And I'm going to be doing a book on watercolor. Uh, oh wow! I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing the yoga postures, but I have started doing, I, I should send them to you. Well, uh, that sounds really exciting. I mean, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing that as a, you know, as a, as a coffee table kind of book, you know? Oh, That's that would be really cool. Project, you know? Well, and, I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, Irene, I can't even tell you how happy I am that we've been able to have <laughs> this kind of time to chat because I yeah, I could, I could definitely chat to you all day. It's not like we even have to go now, but I know, you know, we, we can do it again. We just had to get this initial thing out because you have so many lives. I have so many lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just getting started, you know. It's, it's, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. And, you know, it's every day, you know, you wake up, you just wiggle your toes, wiggle your hands, you know, stretch a little bit. Hey, everything's working. So we're starting another day, you know. <laughs> you well, could wake up and go, oh my God, I can't move my head. What the hell is going on? So, um, <laughs> you know, it's just another day, another beautiful day that God has given to us, you know, whether it's rainy, it's beautiful, whether it's sunshiny, it's beautiful. You know, it's just always different, always different. Well, and, I'll. All of the years that I've known you, every time I, any time I would see you, you were always one of those smiles in class uh, <laughs> that encouraged me to go further in in class and out of class. And you always, uh, you know, that, and that's one of the beautiful things about just being a light. You're not the light's not thinking about being a light. You're just being a light, and you help more people than you realize just by being who you are. And I'm definitely one of those people. So thank you so oh, much for taking the time today. And look at you created yourself into a uh, My gosh, I don't know what it is, but you look beautiful. <laughs> thank you. So I want to thank oh, Irene Sue for joining me today on Mind Your Isness. If you want to get a copy of her book, A Watercolor Dream, The Many Lives of Irene Sue, check it out on Amazon or Kindle and many other places, actually. And be sure to subscribe to Mind Your Isness.